morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Let's worship together. into the light of your presence to live free in you.
to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold him. Jesus is 
you and we want to praise you. We want to thank you, Father, that you have bought and paid for us with your precious blood, my God. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand here today and sing your praises. We just want to lift your name on high. We want to glorify you and we want to magnify you. 
Jesus, it's all about you. It's all about your death on the cross. It's all about what you have done for us and how much you love us. And we just want to give you glory back, my God. Thank you, my Lord, in Jesus' name. seated. My name is Jerisha, Jerisha Ellistrand. Some of you guys might know me as Jerry. Um, I'm an old, old member who's come back and it is my privilege today to share communion with you. Um, for those of you who are watching online, uh, if you're not ready with your uh, cups of juice or, and bread, uh, feel free to press pause and come back when you're ready. Um, so I want to share with you before we, we share communion together. Uh, last Tuesday, um, we did a mini, you could almost say micro Bible study, just a couple of verses with the young adults. And from the time I discovered this verse a couple of months ago, just doing like a reading plan through the Bible, I've been fascinated by it. It is it's found in Exodus chapter 24, for those of you who want to get ready. And you know, cultures throughout history, cultures today, in all these cultures, food is very important. We gather around food, we gather around a table, we get to know each other. We have a good time, a laugh, good food, and we form relationships, we form intimacy. And food can make or break a party. How many people know that? It can cause acquaintances to become friends. God knows this. And Jesus knows this as well. There are theologians who say that Jesus ate and drank his way through the Gospels. The Pharisees were offended when Jesus ate with sinners because he was associating with them. He was accepting them. He was becoming a part of who they were and making him, making them a part of who he was. So let's read this scripture, Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 to 11. And it should come up on the screen as well. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. That's the NIV version. I really like what the NLT says in that last verse, verse 11. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. So what had happened here in this, in this story? For a bit of background, uh, a few chapters before, Moses has received the Ten Commandments. He's received a few other uh, commandments as well. He's taken them down to the Israelites and they have said, yes, all these commandments we will obey. Uh, and so they... They get together as a community with the elders there. They sacrifice some animals, bulls and lambs. Don't quote me on that, but they sacrifice some animals, bulls and some other animals. And Moses takes the blood. And half of the, and this sounds really weird to us today, I know. But Moses takes the blood, he splashes half against the altar, and he splashes the other half, he sprinkles it on the people. Uh, and then... The elders of Israel, together with Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's two sons, they go up the mountain. So they've just agreed to covenant terms. They've sacrificed animals. They've been sprinkled with blood. And they go up to God. And then in these verses, we see that they look upon him. And they eat and drink a covenant meal with him. They had a party together. Today, it is the same with us. My Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It hasn't changed. We accept Jesus, and we agree to covenant terms, the most amazing terms you can ever get. 
our sin for his righteousness. We lay down our lives to his lordship. Jesus, i.e. God himself, is the sacrifice. And we are now under his blood. We're sprinkled with his blood. We're covered and we're protected. And in this state, we can go to God. We can look upon him. We can eat and drink a covenant meal with him. As I said before, eating a meal with someone is to accept them, to get to know them, to spend time with them. God has accepted us. Now he wants us to spend time with him and get to know him. He wants to spend time with us and get to know us. He wants, the he wants us to take the time to sit down and share a meal with him. The bread and the cup that we're going to have today, they're symbols of the sacrifice and the blood. And as we share communion together, I want us all to remember as we go out into our weeks that we shouldn't forget the next step of this, is the step of sitting down and taking the time to get to know God. Eat His Word, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do as these elders did, do as the disciples did on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Take the time to have a meal with Him and to get to know Him. So let us prepare ourselves to have communion. So we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 onwards. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink together.
Fantastic. Please take your seats. And uh, wherever you're watching us here online, I want you to know you've walked into a place, you've tuned into a place of unconditional love and acceptance. What a rich sense of the presence of God. Um, it's a great sense of delight that this morning I want to introduce to you our newest and latest staff member of Runcorn Christian Church. And that will be Terry Rocker and her husband will be, uh, he won't be on staff, but he'll be here a lot. And uh, that's Paul. Uh, most people, when they get, I'll just give you a bit of the background, and then we'll get Terry up just to introduce, and we're going to pray over her. Most people, when they get a job, get it one of two ways. Maybe this is how you got your first job. You knew someone. You had a connection. They put a good word in for you. You ever heard it said, it's not what you know, it's who you know? That's not how Terry got this job. There's another way people get a job, and that's probably a more traditional way. Uh, that, that you put an ad in a paper or, or post it online somehow, someone sees it and they reply. Uh, that's not how Terry got this job. So a little bit of a background. Late last year, Ezra said, you know, I feel that um, I want to resign from youth pastor. He's still really committed to our church, really committed to the youth, and he's doing a great job. But he goes, I, I just don't think I should be in this position at this time. And so we thought we've got to get a new youth pastor. So we did what you normally do. I rang up everyone, all my contacts. Didn't get any calls. Then we paid for advertising. We went to head office. Nothing happened. I mean, the only people that answered our calls for jobs were people from third world nations that couldn't speak English, that didn't have entry rights to Australia, and the job description said, you got to speak English, you got to have Australian residency, and you got to believe our stuff. Well, we had one person, and they, were, uh, they, they believed you had to worship on a Sabbath, and all they wanted to do was end time crusades, and they applied for the job. Um, no one had any experience with youth. So then Cameron said, leave it to me. I'll stalk people. And so Cameron said, I'm going to go on LinkedIn and track people down. Now, Terry finished Bible college last year, and she felt God give her a Holy Spirit prompt going, someone's going to contact you on LinkedIn and offer you a job. I mean, this is just weird, bizarre stuff. And so Cameron's stalking people on LinkedIn, and... Uh, he goes, I think I got a hit. And so um, I think I'm in isolation because I had family staying with us with COVID. And so a couple of the board went and met her. And it became pretty apparent real quick, she's not going to be a youth pastor. But we were restructuring the church. Things were changing. Jason felt his season had come to an end and we wanted to restructure things. And they turned to me and go, Wayne, Terry, you want to meet her? I got out of the, my COVID lockdown and I never got sick but I was in lockdown anyway and we met with her and we just felt that Terry was called by God to be in our church you're going to pick up something very quickly Terry is a people person for some time now we as a church have probably lacked pastoral care and especially with the ladies of our church Terry loves God and loves people you'll be lucky to get out of here without Terry saying hello to you today I mean she officially starts when she gets prayed for shortly and she's already met half the church. <laughs> um, so we want to pray for her. In, in the book of Acts, it says this. It says, you read this time and time again, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. I want you to know, church, whether you're watching online with this or here today, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. We prayed over this a lot. So I'm going to ask Terry to come up now. She's going to share for one minute, just tell us briefly about herself. Then the board and the elders are going to come. We're going to lay hands on her and set her apart for this season of ministry in our church. One minute. <laughs> I have to say, 
somebody did know me, and that was God. Um, my husband Paul and I appreciate and graciously will enter Uncorn. We are excited for this time. I'm just going to tell you quickly. I have, in my life, known small, but I've known big in God. My testimony is huge, and I'm sure I'll get to share it with you. Um, you know, from young, I've moved from level to level with God. And I got to this level, and I know I wanted this God more. So I searched. So I went to another level, and I wanted this God more. And I searched. And I can get to what level? And I need this God more, and I'm still searching. So we're going to search together. I can tell you something. God, one day, or sometime, I went to my knees, and I prayed, and I said, God, how you love me, I want to love people. So God supernaturally, graciously blessed me, and I just feel this love and this care and this need to pastor, to love, to go out and to make sure that everybody is okay in any manner. So I just want you to know, through me, through God, and through me, I see you. And I'm here for you. And the last thing, I am weak. I'm so weak. But I can tell you, in God, I am strong. Fantastic. We can have, just stay standing up. Stay standing up. We're going to pray for you. If the elders and the board can come forth, and Paul come up as well. So, so I'd ask you to stretch out your hands. Now, if you're watching online at home, I know we've probably got as many people online as what we have here. Stretch out your hand towards the monitor. Um, God's spirit can move anywhere, anyway. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we charge Terry and her husband to stay in tune with you. We charge her to love you and to love people and use things. It's so easy for us to love things and use people, but we charge her today to love God and to use things. You tell us to ask for wisdom, and that we were to ask you for wisdom, you'd give it to us liberally. We ask right now for a spirit of wisdom an impartation from your spirit to be upon her life. I thank you that you give it in abundance. We would ask you to help her to get a, to train people, equip people, and nurture people in their faith. We pray for Terry and her husband, that they would both be conduits for your Holy Spirit to flow. And if there be any hindrance or any blockage, we ask that you would remove it. And we set her apart for this season of serving people in this church. We do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Welcome to Terry and Paul. You're on. So right now, um, if you're watching us online or here, you'll notice there's a little barcode coming up. If you've got a prayer request, we're getting lots and lots of prayer requests lately. Just send it in right now. Simon's shortly going to do the announcements. At the end of that, he'll pray in faith with a community of people for whatever needs you have this morning. God bless. Thanks, Wayne. Good morning, everyone. Um, might be up top. Um, so just as Wayne said, just a few announcements this morning, and then obviously we certainly will pray. Uh, we want to welcome you to church, whether you're here or at home, and um, just pray, you have a, pray that you have a great time with us of fellowship and blessing along the way with that. Um, as Wayne mentioned, make sure you do continue to uh, give us your prayer requests and also praise notes. We want to also you know, rejoice with you as great things are happening in your life as well. Also, uh, we continue to be faithful to God, to give of our tithes and offerings, and you can do that in a couple of ways. There's obviously the online version of that, which is, is an easy way to do things, but if you just love to be able to put cash into a container, you can do that as well at the information desk. So please remember to, to do that also. Morning tea 
Uh, it's always been our culture. Jerisha shared about Jesus eating his way through the Gospels, but we love to fellowship. We love to spend time together after church. We don't just rush off. So please join with us this morning for, um, for some morning tea and some fellowship. Having said that as well, we really need people to volunteer and to help us in the ministry of being able to provide morning tea. Our numbers have shrunk a little bit in this area, so I please encourage you to, um, you know, to catch up with, with Alana. So please see Alana and she'll be able to really bring you in, show you what needs to happen. You know, when I first came here to this church 25 years ago or whatever it was, but there was only, you know, it was a handful, it was like 40 people were here. But, you know, doing tea and coffee through the years was a way that Catherine and I got to know everybody. You, you're serving tea and coffee, you know everybody, have a chat to them. Know everybody when there was 40, 60, 80, 100, you start to lose a few people after that. 120, 150. But I really encourage you that if you, you know, if you want to be part and contribute, come along and, and help out with tea and coffee. It's a great way to just... Inch, inch, uh, inch a little bit into, into helping and supporting and volunteering. So I want to encourage you about that. Youth is on this Friday, 7 o'clock to 9 p.m. for all high schoolers. Remember also men's breakfast, Saturday, 26th of February, 8 a.m. start. We're going to be out at Greg Waters' home for that. So men, please register for that online or at the information desk. Always have a great breakfast, great time to share and fellowship together for the men of the church. Worship Arts Ministry. It's an all-in practice on Wednesday, the 2nd of March at 7 p.m. So for all current worship team members and anyone interested in joining our Worship Arts Ministry, here's your chance, Wayne. It's a new year. <laughs> it's a new opportunity. You never know. We'll go together. We'll give it a go. So Worship Arts Ministry, please come along Wednesday the 2nd of March at 7 p.m. There's a parenting seminar which is being you know, facilitated and run online with Andy Kirk. He's the ACC Kids National Director. Oh, he's going to be with us on Sunday, the March the 6th. There you go. Didn't know that. So Andy will be here following the service. Andy and his wife, Christy, will be holding a parenting seminar on how to raise your children in a Christian faith. Registrations are required as lunch will also be served. So don't miss this opportunity. Andy is a great communicator a wonderful leader, and he will be able to provide so much support and information uh, for you in that area. So remember to do that. Register for that as well. Okay, so as Wayne said, we do uh, encourage people to give us prayer requests. I know during the week, uh, Jenny Montaccio, Monty's probably not here this morning. No. So Jenny had heart surgery. Uh, so she needs our prayers for, for, you know, for incredible healing after that. And um, everything went well, but, you know, it's a tough thing to, to get through and to build up strength again after that. So we'll be praying um, for Jenny for sure in that. The other thing I was reading um, this morning in the, um, in the scriptures, just very briefly, and one of the things I just looked for, and it was in... In Luke 8, and it was around the time, remember the, the woman who had the issue of blood? And I'll just read a little bit of scripture there. And so she was reaching out to Jesus. She was pushing through the crowds and she reached out. And, and at that time, and her bleeding, she was healed immediately. And Jesus said, who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And you know what struck me again? We've all read that so many times. But you know, that was somebody, that woman was someone who knew where her healing rested. A lot of times we know Jesus reached out. He was the instigator of healing that took place. 
But in this situation, Jesus is being surrounded by everyone. He feels the power leave his body. And so the woman, you know, she knew where she needed to go. In a sense, I mean, there's probably a big message around this, you know, like of, of, of you know, perhaps Jesus didn't, wasn't aware of her, didn't know she was there. Do we pray to God and he doesn't hear us? Do we think he doesn't hear us? But the thing is, is with this lady, she knew where her healing rested. And so this morning as we pray just want to encourage everybody that we know where our healing rests, don't we? We'll stretch out this morning. This is what we want to do for Jenny, for anybody else who needs healing today. It was this lady's faith. Let's all pray and develop that faith. I know we often feel we can't get there, but you know, let's try and reach out today and pray in faith. Lord God, we come to you today as, as a people of faith people who just want to stretch out their hand to Jesus to just receive of your healing power. And Lord God, I pray right now for Jenny as she is recovering from her surgery. Lord, in a supernatural way, I pray that your, your spirit, your healing power will rest upon her. She will regain strength and vigor. It will be amazing to the doctors at how quickly that she recovers from the surgery that she's had. And so, Father God, for anybody in this congregation or online today, Lord, those that need your healing, whether from emotional or physical, spiritual, in any area, Lord God, we reach out to Jesus Christ, who through his blood, through his stripes, we can be and will be healed. And we thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Every person in this room, whether you're aware of it or not, share a common purpose in life. And that purpose is to glorify God and enjoy his presence forever. That's why we've been traveling through the Psalms for the past few weeks. And if you're a Christ follower, and I pray that you are, there's a strong chance at some point in your life, you're going to feel drawn to the Psalms like bees at honey. There's a reason for that. I get that. When life doesn't make sense, we read the Psalms. They talk about times when life doesn't make sense. And some psalms give us words for passionate joy that, that comes when a dream comes true. There are other psalms that, they're the other end of the spectrum. They give words to the despair that hits our heart when a dream gets crushed. The psalms remind us it doesn't matter what we're going through. We're not the first ones to go down this path. In fact, the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 songs and poems and, and prayers. They're written over a, a, a period of probably a thousand years by a whole variety of authors. Um, they're all from different points in Israel's history. We rightly think of King David as a warrior, the guy that slew the giant. But you know what else? He also played a harp. And he wrote 73 of the Psalms that we have. His son Solomon, he wrote one. Moses wrote another one. Others, we, we don't know who wrote them. We're going to look at one of those psalms. We haven't got a clue who really wrote it. And, and we, we do know a little bit about some of these psalms that we don't know who wrote them. You see, there was this guy called Korah. Korah. Let me tell you a little bit about Korah. He was a bad egg. He was a really bad guy, Korah. He was a, a traitor. He was the type of a guy... That when you just met him and you're face to face, he would say everything you wanted to hear. He'd be really nice. He'd be really friendly. As soon as you walk out of the room from Cora, he'd stab you in the back. He was a treacherous traitor. He was stubborn, unteachable, obnoxious. His actions led to a lot of people losing their lives. It's just he had some sons. And his sons had a different spirit to what he had. And they had some sons and they held on to that different spirit. They were Levites. And they were called the descendants of Korah. That's all we know about these people that wrote eight psalms, the descendants of Korah. And as a Levite, all males were expected to go to the temple once a year for a working bee. Uh, it, it, to work in the temple, it sounds really spiritual. You know, what are you doing? I'm going to work in the temple. But anyway, they were like maintenance guys and cleaners. And it was a bit like military service or jury duty. If you're a Levite, you had to do it whether you wanted to do it or not. So... They're going to the temple. It was their job to go there and clean and maintain. It's just these guys, the sons of Korah, they did more than clean. They did more than maintain. They wrote eight psalms. We're going to look at one of the eight psalms they wrote. 
Now, broadly speaking, the Psalms fall into two main categories. Uh, they've got either songs of lament or songs of praise. The songs of lament, they focus on the agony, the pain, the disappointments, the confusion we all face in life. Sounds weird, but they used to sing these songs of moaning to God. They'd sing about what's wrong in the world and then ask God to do something about it. And I imagine today, if we were singing songs about what's wrong in the world, and people go, you need to get a new music director. They're, they're horrible songs, but they were depressing some of these psalms. 42 of them. Depressing psalms. And, and they, tell us to, they tell us throughout life, you're going to witness things you don't like. You're going to see things that aren't right. And so when things are not right, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to lament. Today we're not going to look at one of those depressing psalms. Today we're going to look at Psalm 84. And it's like the opposite. It's a praise psalm. It's a song of praise and joy and celebration. But it's not focusing on what's wrong in the world. It focuses on what's right in the world. They give praise to God by these psalm praises. They retell the stories of what God's done in times past. So these boys of the family name, synonymous with treachery, write eight songs and we're still singing them and reading them and talking about them 3,000 years later. If that's the case, because we don't even know what their names are, we know nothing really about them, maybe God's not looking for people with perfect backgrounds. Maybe... God doesn't want us to seek prominence in life. He'd rather us seek significance in life. Prominence speaks of position. Hey, look at me. Look what I can do. Look at how great I am. Significance doesn't care about position. Its desire is to make the world a better place, and you don't care who gets the credit for it. These boys long for something more than just the mundane things of life. They wanted to get away from a bustling world back in their hometown with their normal responsibilities and all their demands and just meet with God. Their song starts with this, how lovely is your dwelling place. Lord Almighty, my soul yearns even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. In their world, if you wanted to encounter God, well, you couldn't really do it at home. Their thought process, their worldview is this. You've got to travel from wherever you are and go all the way to Jerusalem. And when you get to Jerusalem, you've got to go to a temple because that's where God is. God's in the temple in this holy of holies. That's where God, you meet God. The good news is, God doesn't dwell in buildings made by people anymore. In fact, he never really did. God dwells in people's hearts that have submitted to him. And I pray that you've submitted your heart to him. God, God, but at the, at the same time, something does happen when God's people do get together. It does, something powerful happens when God's people get together. I could probably tell you the most significant things that have happened in my life, spiritually speaking, have happened when I was in church not when I was at a theme park or at a movie theater or at a restaurant or watching football, which I'm very much looking forward to coming back on television. You see, you can get information online. And I honor every person that's watching our live stream this morning. I understand that we're at the tail end. I pray we're at the tail end of a pandemic, and I get that. It's just transformation doesn't take place when you're online. Transformation tends to take place when you're of a group of people. This is Jesus' handle on this. He goes, for where two or three gathered together as my followers, I am there among them. It must have been a dozen or so years back where this guy walked through our doors. And just from one look at him, you could tell he was shaking. He, he, he was a mess. He made a commitment to Christ. Truth be told, his life was a mess. His marriage was over. And when your marriage falls over, it tends to spill into every part of your life. So every part of his life was just a mess. He made a commitment to Christ, but in, in, even before that, he, he went to see a counsellor, and it was probably a good idea to go see a counsellor. And it must have been, I don't know, the third or fourth session when he seen the counsellor. He's going, hey, by the way, I've made this commitment to Christ, and I'm going to church now for Sunday morning. And he thought the counsellor would go, oh, good on you. The counsellor didn't go, good on you. The counsellor said, it's, I told you to get a support group. I didn't tell you to go to church. But if that's the only support group you can get, well, that's okay. But I warn you, I warn you, they will try to brainwash you. So you be careful. Don't let them brainwash you. I think that counselor was onto something really big. When God's people gather together, our brains get washed. I don't know about you, but my brains get dirtied every week. Every week they get dirtied. And when I come in here and Rebecca led the praise and worship this morning, Something washed about my brains. It was good for me. It was good for my soul. 
So next time someone comes up to you and says, oh, here they brainwash people around Uncle Christian Church. You go, yeah, every Sunday they guarantee to brainwash you. The song starts off with this, how lovely is your dwelling place? And it moves on. It moves on. Our world is changing at an incredibly rapid rate. And in some ways that's good, in some ways that, that's bad. The healthcare system we have today, it's unbelievable. Jenny has a heart attack. She doesn't die. They cut her up a bit and put some things in her and she's alive and she's going to live a long life. I mean, we've got a dozen people in our church, or at least half a dozen that I know of, that have had open heart surgery, bypass surgery, and living wonderful lives. It's fantastic. Not only is our healthcare system fantastic, that uh, we, we seem to be able to live long lives. And, and in Australia, they pay you, once you hit 66 at the moment, they pay you till you die to sit home and watch Judge Judy. It's an incredible system. Very few countries in the world pay people to sit home and watch Judge Judy. Um, my mobile phone. It is more powerful than the computer that put man on the moon. I've got a smartphone. I don't use much of it, but it's got, a, it's got that much power. Information is never more than a push of a button away. And sometimes you don't even have to push a button. I'm at home, we put this little device in our bedroom. It's a Hey Google thing. I'm always in bed 10 minutes before she's in bed, so I go, Hey Google, what's the weather like? What's it like, what's it like in Huntsville, Canada? We went there once. I want to know what the weather's like. It's minus 27 degrees last night. Glad I was in Brisbane. I can ask Google anything. It just tells me straight away with this girl's voice. I'm, I'm in a female-dominated household. I'm always having girls tell me what to do, so what's the difference? So, so many things are getting better. But standards and values, they've changed. And it's confusing. Our standards and values are about as stable as a bowl of jelly. Absolutes are now as rare as hen's teeth. What was once now considered pornography is now considered entertainment. And if you call it out, you call it out for body shaming. How dare you body shame me? Men are baited day in, day out to look at things they know they shouldn't look at. But if they touch what they're looking at, they're about as popular as a chicken running through a KFC car park. In a world that stands for little and falls for so much, it's good to know that Jesus is not and will never change. Let's just pretend for a moment, just pretend, no emails, no letters, Star Wars is real, we're pretending. And Yoda's younger brother is an anthropologist and he comes down to, us, to planet Earth and he wants to study us and send a report back to Yoda about what people are like on planet Earth. So he starts his research. I wonder what he'd write about us as a species. Would he say... The creature at the top of the food chain. They're weird. They're erratic. In one breath, they have this guy runs into a burning building. He risks his life and limb to save this aging citizen that's probably got 80 hours of life left anyway. I mean, this person's so old and so close to death, they cannot buy an unripe banana. They'll never eat it. They'll do that. And then, for no apparent reason, they act like a wild beast and kill and maim their own kind. Would his research reveal that government funding was used to kill defenceless unborn babies along with depressed senior citizens? Would they say their popular culture encourages their young people to experiment with mind-altering substances that long-term destroy the quality of their life? Would it say they get more concerned over saving an old tree in an old suburb so they can build a highway than they do about about saving a child suffering from malnutrition in a third world country. Remember when you were young and you wanted to be cool? I've given up on trying to be cool. My wife told me I was never cool anyway. Everyone tells me I was never cool, which is okay. Maybe when you were young you wanted to be like Taylor Swift or Orlando Bloom or someone. Can I let you in on a little secret? God's not cool. And he never, if we're going to reflect his glory, we shouldn't try to be cool. We should tr never try to be something that God never intended us to be. Let me give you a quick definition of cool. To be cool is to be undisturbed and unfazed about what's happening around you. Eli the prophet, his son said, you're cool, Eli. Let me give you a bit of the story. Um, 
Eli. His son said he was cool, and uh, they were actually insulting Dad when they said he was cool. Eli used to talk to God like, I'm talking to you right now. He was a, once a great man of God. And when Eli got up to speak, it was like God was speaking to you. So it was a little bit scary and a little bit freaky. So close was Eli to God that God would talk to him like I'm talking to you. And they would have these conversations. Have you ever heard this? Familiarity breeds contempt. Well, Eli was in this environment where he's in God's presence all the time. And he's in the temple of God all the time. And he has two boys and they've grown up around the temple and around God's presence. But as they got old, they got corrupt. And unlike Korah's descendants, they didn't long to be in God's presence. They just treated it with contempt. They used to go into the temple. This is these boys. And then people would bring a sacrifice to atone to take away their sins. They'd bring the best lamb that they had. And they'd bring it to the temple. And the boys would see that and go, well, that's a good lamb. And they'd just take it off the temple and take it home and have a barbecue with their mates. These boys just had a contempt. They would see young girls that were impressionable and vulnerable and young. And they would take advantage of them. Word gets out to Eli about what his boys are doing. And Eli has so much pressure upon him. He goes, well, I'll have, I'll have, leave it to me. I'll have a word from my boys. So he calls his boys together. And he goes, boys, I've been hearing these stories about you. Okay. Could you please stop? Could you please stop? No consequences. No punishment. And as soon as dad leaves, the boys go, how cool is dad? He said what he had to say, but he's done nothing to stop us. We can now go back to doing what we were doing before. Church has been a bit like that over the years. We've had the discernment to see all the faults in the world and talk about it behind its back and at the same time powerless to implement change. Could it be that our desire to look cool and be accepted has come at a cost of lacking moral authority? The psalm continues, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. To be blessed means you're successful, you're happy, you're enjoying life. That's what it means to be blessed. It means to be successful. There's a joy associated in living your life with Jesus Christ. There is a strength, there's a security that comes from praising God. Might and power may have their limitations, but there is no limitation to the spirit of the living God. The spirit of the living God can find a way where there is no way. God can heal a relationship to, to all intents and purposes, can never live again. The Spirit of God brings wholeness into a life that's plagued by insecurities and anxiety. That's what the Spirit of God does. He gives us a peace that defies circumstances. <coughs> These boys are on a pilgrimage. All good Jews know that three times a year, they're expected to go from wherever they live in Israel to Jerusalem for a pilgrimage. They would expect it. They had to go to the Passover. That was like mandatory. And there they would bring a lamb or a sacrifice. It would be sacrificed in the temple to deal with their sin issue. There were two other festivals in the year. The second one was Pentecost. At Pentecost, they would have a feast. They would enjoy the first fruits of the lamb. There was harvest that come in. And then they would thank God around this festival for the Torah, the Bible, God's word. They thank God that he'd given them revelation on how to live life. And the final festival was the festival of booths. They'd live in a tent for a week. I love camping. But I'm aware that we have people here that hate camping, that uh, refuse that the only time they camp is under five stars, five star hotels. But I'm happy to sleep out just beside a fire before I get about putting the tent up. Greer's is not, so we have some stresses and challenges in our relationship. Um, but she's a good girl. She comes camping with me every couple of years for two nights if they've got hot showers. Um, these boys, they just longed to be there. And the reason they stayed in these tents was they were thanking God for the time of his protection and provision when they traveled around the wilderness. They're reminded of the, the Exodus period, that 40 years. Here's what I know about travel. They're three times a year they're traveling to, to Jerusalem. You can travel out of obligation or you can do it out of anticipation. These boys went to Jerusalem out of anticipation. They longed for the presence of God. When I was a young boy, from time to time, my parents would make me go visit grandma. My grandma and grandpa lived in Mullumbimby, New South Wales. And I remember when we'd drive there, dad would pull the car over when we were five minutes out from Mullumbimby. He'd go quiet, and then mum would turn around and go, we're about to go to grandma's. If you've got to get something out of your system, do it now. 
You see, my grandma lived by the motto, children should be seen and not heard. And when we got to grandma's, we'd get put in a corner and get told, don't touch anything. We'll only have to be here two hours and then we can go to your auntie's place and you can have fun there on a farm. Just don't touch anything. Don't say anything. So my brother had ADHD. You tried doing that to him, I mean. This is not the picture the boys are trying to paint. <laughs> They're not there begrudgingly. They're looking forward to being there. They can hardly wait to be with God's people. They're living with an expectation that God is going to do something, and they don't want to miss out. The next verse on, tells us about their journey to Jerusalem. It says, And as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. We, we don't know how far they had to walk these boys, the descendants of Korah, to get to Jerusalem. If they were from Capernaum, which is up north, it's not at the top of Israel, but up north, where Jesus spent most of his ministry around Galilee, they would have to spend 40 hours walking to get there on today's standards with straight roads. I imagine back then there would have been a lot more crooked paths. It would take more than 40 hours. Now, whether they walked or went on a donkey, it would still take 40 hours because the donkey walks at the same pace we walk at. That's a long time to be sitting on a donkey, 40 hours. And even a donkey can't carry that much. Warren Wisby describes the Valley of Bacca as any difficult and painful place in life where everything seems hopeless and you feel helpless, like a pit of despair. What a weird song to sing. I'm going through a valley of suffering and sorrow. Trust God, pass through a valley of weeping. If that was to be written by Hillsong, they'd never sell it. Who in their right mind would want to do such a thing? Only those who realize that their strength and security comes from God and God alone. Yet we are told these guys are blessed. And we said before that to be blessed is to be successful. Not only were they physically in the valley of weeping, they were emotionally in the valley of weeping. In my early 20s, I spent a season of my life in that great wonderful land of Papua New Guinea. My memories of Papua New Guinea are just unbelievable. I talk about it all the time. I've spent my entire life trying to teach my children to speak pidgin English. To my disgrace, they speak none of it. And uh, I have these incredible memories of everywhere I went because I went from station to station. I, I was a builder, so I built churches. I built Bible college. I had a ball. Everywhere I went, I enjoyed every church except one church. I hated my time in Gordon's Port Moresby. And the only time I hated was when the church service was on. We had this guy, and he was from Sydney. Not against Sydney, but he was from Sydney. And he was a bookkeeper, and he went up there, and he would mainly just count beans during the week. I don't know what he did, to tell you the truth. But on a Sunday, he would grab a microphone and talk. Jerisha this morning did communion in about five minutes. I think she did a great job. Yeah, let's give Jerisha a clap. The guy in Port Moresby spent 30 minutes doing communion. And then after that, they'd sing another song. Then he would preach. And he would preach for 60 minutes, week in, week out. We used to call him Manung Mousewa. The words just flow like a river out of his mouth. He would speak for so long, but for the life of me, I cannot remember a single word he said. There's a reason I can't remember a single word he said. The moment he spoke, I don't know, I just went into autopilot. I used to stare out the window on the right-hand side of the church, and there were these hills in the distance where the nationals used to go up and hunt ruse. They got some ruse in Port Moore's, been out in the hills and the swamps, and they'd sell them in the marketplace. And they, as he was speaking, I'd go, blah, 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 blah. And I'd be just dreaming of being up in those hills with a spear hunting down a rue to sell at the markets. I thought about that for months, being up in those hills. I was never emotionally. You see, you can be somewhere physically, but not emotionally there. These boys are physically and emotionally in the valley of weeping. They are there. Life is a pilgrimage, and it's our choice where we're going to be, where we're going to be. One day, if we're on this pilgrimage, we'll be in the very presence of God. The valley of Baca is filled with goat tracks that wound up and down the hills, tracks that were covered with manure and broken branches and fallouts and washouts and rocks. It's just these guys were doing the right thing for the right reason. They were there emotionally, 
And as far as they were concerned, we're not on a goat track. We're on a highway that's going to take us into the very presence of God. Life is a pilgrimage, you know. And one day, it will take us right into the presence of God. Yet this world has a terrible conception of the church. They think church is a, a building where weird people hang out. And, and the only time non-weird people hang out is for a wedding or a funeral. And that's why it's so important that each and every one of us be an active message of Jesus Christ. Do that and people will flock to our meetings by the hundreds. All you have to do is allow what God's doing in your spirit to flow out and touch someone else. I wonder how many people here know a teenager, a husband or a wife who comes to church every week out of a sense of religion. or not, not, I'm not talking about a love for God. It's, like, uh, it's more like out of a fear for mum or dad, you know? The fear like never produces a positive impact. You know, you've got to go to church, otherwise mum will nag you all week, so it's just worth turning up for an hour and a half to get it out of it. I'm done. Otherwise mum will just, it'd just be a horrible week. Not only were these boys in the right direction, moving in the right direction, they were at the right motive. And they wanted to be there. And they said, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rain covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. The valley of Baca is a real place. The psalmist is not writing about Middle Earth. This place was cursed. When Baal worship existed in Israel, this is where they would take the children out to and they would sacrifice them children to appease the God of Baal. It's a place of weeping. It's a place of sorrow. It's a desert. It's not a place of abundance. It's cursed. It name literally means a place of weeping, a place of sorrow. It's a desert, and anyone who lived in the south, if they wanted to get to Jerusalem, they had to walk through the valley of Baca. There was no other way. This is probably the exact same valley that the guy was beaten up in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. It's hard to get through this valley. Many a beach blown, a donkey and rider lay in the sand, an example of what happens when you try to cross this valley with no water. It's a place of sorrow. It's just as these boys go through it, they say, we make it a place of spring. How do you turn a dry, barren valley into a place of spring when you don't have a windmill, you don't have a shovel, you, you, you don't have drilling equipment, you don't have a water tank? How do you do that? How do you create a spring? Well, even if you had a shovel, you could shovel yourself to death and never hit water. This is what would happen. As they're traveling across the desert, some person who cared more about someone else than themselves gets off his donkey, falls to his knees in the hot burning sand, and he starts to pull the sand bank back and make a pit. Then they get a whole lot of rocks and they place these rocks and make it like a dam. There's no water in it. He makes a big pool, but there's no water in it. He will not drink one drop out of it. He's going to sweat more than he'll drink. Yet he makes a pool. He stands to his feet. There's no water in it at all. Hops on his donkey and he heads back on his trip into the sunset. The donkey must think, what an ignorant fool I have for a master. What an idiot. We could have both died here. I'm tied up. It's hot. We have very limited water. I can only carry so much. Isn't it true? It's easy to give out of abundance. It's harder to give when you don't have a lot. It's a whole lot harder to give when you don't know, when you know this is going to hurt me, it's going to cost me, I'm going to go without there was time that Jesus was with his disciples in the temple of Jerusalem and, and the, that Jesus was doing an object lesson. Often when he did object lessons, the disciples would get it wrong. Anyway, they go to the temple and they see this guy. He's a wealthy guy. They can tell he's wealthy. He's wearing name brand clothes with little logos on them. If something's expensive, it's important to put a logo on it, double the price. And so he's wearing logo shirts and he's dumping these coins. They didn't have paper money then. But big coins, expensive coins, dumping them, and, and, the, and the symbol is making a huge noise, and everyone's watching, and, and the disciples are seeing this, and they're hitting each other on the ribs. They go, at last Jesus is teaching us something I understand. This is the type of guy we need to get on our boards and our leadership team to have a successful ministry. And they go, yeah, good one, Jesus, that's good. Then out of the corner of their eye, they see this widow, and you could tell she was poor because her clothes probably came from a second-hand shop, didn't fit properly. She walks up and all she has is two little copper coins. We don't even have copper coins in our currency anymore. She drops them into the offering pot and they don't make much noise. And two little copper coins, you can't buy much of them at all. You couldn't even buy a Happy Meal with it. It's just 
nothing. And Jesus goes, do you see that guy? And he goes, yeah, 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 we got it, Jesus. We're going to talk to that guy straight after church. Jesus goes, no, no, you don't understand giving. When I look at giving, I don't look at how much they give. I look at how much they, give, how much they have left over after they give. And she's the big giver here. She's the person you want on your leadership team, not that guy. Well, they didn't understand that lesson, and people are still struggling to understand that lesson. But that's what you do when you create a pool of blessing for other people to drink from. The person who got off his donkey and dug a pool by many standards must have been considered a fool. He could have been jumped on and robbed like the guy in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's just eventually the rain does come. And the water that would have been swallowed up in the sand fills that pool. Then in time, another pilgrim goes by, dying of thirst, fatigued. They look over, and there's a pool of water. And that person drinks from the water. Life flows back into their body. Why? Because somebody got off their donkey, dug a hole, put some rocks there, and left. Want to know something? We're all like that man. We're all drinking of a product of someone else's investment. None of us have paid the price that brought us into relationship with Jesus Christ. Many of us never made a sacrifice for this church to be what it is today. But some of those springs we're drinking from today, well, they've gotten shallow over the years. They don't work as well as they perhaps once did. And God wants us in this season to dig new wells. If I could have the singers and musicians up, that would be wonderful. Wells that we may never, ever drink from ourselves. It's easy to say, oh, praise God, someone got off their donkey and dung a spring for me. But does it inspire you to do the same for someone else? To go a little bit further on your journey, get off your donkey and dig a well for someone else. It's easy to get caught up with life and focus our attention on God bless me, heal me, help me, or someone really close to me. But would you get off your donkey? Would you be prepared to say no to your agenda and dig a well for someone else. This is what the psalmist said. Better is one day in the courts, your courts, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tent sense of the wicked. The doorkeeper. The job of the doorkeeper was to stand at the door of the temple, get up really early in the morning and open it for people to come. And then when they saw people come, they'd done their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And on the pilgrimage, you can't help but sometimes you get dirty. And there'd be people that have a little bit of camel dung on their feet, a little bit of donkey poo on their feet, just the grit of life. And it would be their job to go, I'm sorry, you're unclean, you can't come into the temple. But and you won't be excluded. The doorkeeper would grab a pot, a pot of water, and wash their feet and go, you can come in now. He's saying, I would rather clean camel poo off someone's feet in the presence of God than to be in the tents of the wicked. Craig Rochelle says of the tents of wicked, if you're sinning and not having fun, well, you're not doing it right. There's so much fun associated with sin for a season. But he goes, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God because it's going to lead to life and abundance and prosperity from my spirit. He finishes by saying, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does He withhold from those who walk is blameless. As the guy gets off his donkey on a hot day, he digs a pool and he goes, You know what? I'm going to reap what I sow in life and I'm going to go from pool to pool of blessing in my life. But the person who drinks from someone else's pool but never digs a pool for someone else, you know what happens? In time, because we always reap what we sow in life, it becomes another bleached bone in the desert. I want to give you three takeaway thoughts and we're going to be done. Number one, when was the last time you cared for someone more than yourself? I'm not saying when did you last care for someone, but they took priority over yourself because that's what sacrificial giving does. It gives someone else priority over yourself. When did that last happen? Number two, when did you last get off your donkey and did something for someone else at a sacrifice to yourself? To yourself. Number three, this is a really big thought. When was the last time you did for something for someone that no one will ever, ever, ever find out about? Because God's calling us to significance, not to prominence. 
When was the last time you did something that no one will ever find out about except you and God? And I have every head bowed and every eye closed. And whether you're watching us online right now or you're here presently in the building, I challenge you, would you surrender your life to Jesus Christ? That's what these boys did, the sons of Korah. They said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to just live for myself. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ or you did and you kind of go, I've just kind of walked away. But today, as you've been talking about this, this life with God, I, something's stirring in my heart. I need to connect with God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, you want to connect with God in a meaningful way today, would you raise your hand towards heaven? Would you just lift your hand up right now? And I'd love to pray for you. Maybe you're online. If that's you, just send us a message. I'd love to pray for you online. Loving Father, I pray you'd help us to live for you and to walk for you and to live for you in a, in a powerful way that we'd be a blessing to many other people. May you pour out your spirit upon us, encourage you and help us to live life your way, not our way, because your way will lead to life and our way will lose life. Loving Father, we honour you and we praise you this morning. Amen and amen.
Okay, just before we close, because we're a church of equal opportunity, I want to remind you about the ladies dessert night coming up and that's going to be the 19th of March from 7 p.m. So ladies, for you, remember that. And also young adults, Tuesday night here in church from 7 p.m. for that as well. Let's just pray. Lord God, we thank you for being with us today. Father, let us take away a message that we want to be significant for you. Lord God, we want to do things behind the scenes or whether it be seen or not seen, but we want, to, we want to be significant for your kingdom. And so, Lord God, I pray that you help each and every one of us, Lord, to do what you have placed upon our hearts, the, the, the purpose and the plan that you have given to us, Lord God. I pray that you help us to take that step out. Give us courage this day, Lord God, to do what you would ask us to do. And let us be significant contributors to your kingdom in this community or wherever that may lead us to be. And so, Father, I pray that you bless your people this day. Lord God, from the moment we wake up until we lay our heads on the pillows, Father God, I pray that your face will shine upon your people. Let them know your presence. Let them feel the blessing and the direction and the goodness of their heavenly Father. And Father, so that we may be significant for you in the walk that you have given to us. And draw us together again next week, Father, so we may as a community worship you, hear your praise, and support each other in love and fellowship. And we thank you, Father, and we pray your blessing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Morning tea. Please welcome Terry and Paul. Come and say hello and um, have a great week. Bless you all.